Okay, <laughs> I'm waiting for my, my director to get the point or whatever. All right, good evening. Welcome, everybody, to our Wednesday night Bible study here in our beautiful sanctuary at South Haven First United Methodist. Let's go back to Romans 9. We still got some work to do in this, these first, what, 18 verses of chapter 9 or tonight. So anyway, let's go there. We're going to be picking up in verse 14. But while we're opening up to Romans 9, let's also now open up with a word of prayer. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, once again, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the gift of this day and of this church. Also, dear God, we do want to thank you for the gift of your Son, the gift of your Holy Spirit, and for the gift of your living, life-giving Word. And so just anoint us with your spirit as you anointed Paul, anoint us now, so that we can open ourselves to you and to what you would have us receive from your word tonight. We ask this as always in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. So last week we looked again like that second reason Paul gives us for what went wrong. Remember, he talks about how the Israelites missed out on recognizing Jesus as the Messiah. This was the second thing that went wrong. And Paul begins the second reason by, as we talked about, referring to Ishmael and Isaac, those sons of Abraham. Paul points out how Ishmael came into this world not just through, you know, the normal human process. More importantly, he came through human weakness, desires, and wants, or Basically, Ishmael came into this world because of Sarah's fear and not trusting in the promise of God that he would give to her and Abraham a son in their old age. Isaac, though, came to this world as a son of promise, came into the world in spite of the fact it was not humanly possible, but he came because of the power and faithfulness of God, which means then that the people of Israel are here because of the faithfulness of God which in turn makes them then people of faith. But in spite of this, Paul points out, not all Abraham's children are his true descendants. Not all, not all the Israelites are faithful as they should be. Sadly, the same thing can be said for many who claim to be Christians. We're not the Christians so many times that we claim to be. So what went wrong is that even though there are some of the Israelites just like Paul, just like the disciples, that had faith to see Jesus as the Messiah, sadly, the majority of the Israelites missed out because they, had, they did not have the faith. They did not have the kind of faith, I should say, that they needed to see Jesus as the Messiah. And then we closed out our time together. We looked at the first two of the three reasons Paul gives as to why God has still not been given up on the Israelites, turned his back. First, to do this, that would mean, you know, God would have to break his promises. To not only to the Hebrew people, he'd have to break his promises to Abraham and to Sarah. So first off, he's not going to turn his back because he's not going to break his promise. And then secondly, because simply, he still loves the people of Israel. Our God loves us all no matter what, with a love that will never be stopped, never ended. And he does this for everybody, which still includes the people of Israel. He loves them. Now let's pick up and look at verses 14 to 18. So join me here. What then are we to say? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I have raised you up for the very purpose of showing my power in you, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he chooses, and he hardens the heart of whomever he chooses. Now we're going to look at the third reason as to why God has not turned his back on the people of Israel. And it's come simply in this way. That just as we have the right to pick and choose 
If we want to follow God, we have the right to pick and choose if we want to be faithful children of God. In that same thought then, God also has the right to do what? To pick and choose. To pick and choose who He will be faithful to. Just as we do, God has the right to pick and choose who He will be faithful to. Now, in looking at this, what would you say is the key verse in this section that I read to you? Now, I'll be honest, if you look at verse 15, a lot of us instantly want to point to verse 15. But I'm going to be honest with you. As far as I'm concerned, that's not the key verse. For me, the key verse is actually there in verse 16, okay? Where it reads, so it depends, not on human will or exertion, but on God who shows mercy. Now, the NIV and the complete, Jane, complete, complete Jewish Bible use the word efforts for exertion. So it depends on human will or efforts. Or not on human will or efforts, but on God. Now, what is Paul saying to us there in that verse? Look at that verse. However you've got yours. Mine got said basically from the New Revised, the NIV, and the complete Jewish Bible. But as you look at that, what do you think Paul is saying to us in this verse? That we need to depend on God. All right, first off, we need to depend upon God. But what is he first saying? What's the, what's the original point of all this? That it doesn't depend on humans. Okay, that it doesn't depend upon humans. First off, that's it, that everything does not depend. It's not just on humans. More importantly, everything does not depend on how we feel as humans or how we react or how we think it should be, okay? First off, it doesn't depend upon humans, but it's not just simply that. It's about, it doesn't depend on how we feel or react or how we think it should be. More importantly, it tells us this, that everything and everyone in the, in the end depends upon what? God, but God depends upon the what of God? Mercy. Decision. The, the mercy. Oh. Then it say that it depends upon the God who shows mercy, okay? You see, the thing is this. What he's trying to tell us is that in spite of everything, in spite of everything that Paul has been teaching the Christians in Rome about the love, the faithfulness, and now the mercy of God, okay? There are still those Christians who want God to do what? To come to power and destroy okay. their enemies. All right. And for the Christians, who's their number one enemy right now? Rome? No. The Jews. Oh, the Jews. Well. You see, there are still those Christians. They want God to, not just because they're the enemy, they want God to punish the Jews because they have done what? They crucified him. They crucified Jesus. They rejected Jesus and they played a role. Remember now, who crucified Jesus? He Jesus. He crucified himself. If he didn't want to go, if there was no need to go, he didn't have to. He, he did it. But Rome, the Jews, <coughs> and us, we play a role in it. They want God to punish Jews because back in this time, they still blamed the Jews are rejecting Jesus and playing a role in that crucifixion. That has always been the basis of the hatred toward the Jews. Because it's always been taught, what? That the Jews crucified Jesus. You know, they want to put the blame on them. But Paul wants them, he wants us to understand that most importantly, that it is not up to those Christians there in Rome. It's not up to us it's not up to them and what they want. That is completely up to who? God. God. You may want it, but that's not, and you have no say in it. Everything you know, is completely up to God. And it is God's right to pick and choose what 
who he will show what to? Favoritism. Or favoritism, or what's the other word? Mercy. Mercy. Remember, this is the key word here. That word mercy. He will and choose who he will show mercy to and who he will not show mercy, mercy to. Okay? So first off, Paul is saying here that you may want to blame them. That's not up to you. God picks and chooses who he gives his mercy to, who he doesn't give his mercy to. But continue on looking at verse 17 with you. Look there at verse 17. Paul here then highlights all this about who God picks and chooses by using the example of who? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. He uses the example of Pharaoh. Now here, you know, he talks about, you know, basically God says to Pharaoh, you're here because I'm going to use you. Okay? I'm going to, but what is it? God can use Pharaoh or whoever he wants in verse 17 to then reveal what two things? His power. His power and what's the other thing that he, he God will prove? His mercy and his forgiveness. Not just, no, look at the, what's the other word in there? Fame. Okay, you got the word fame? Please. There's another word I've got. Oh. Look at, okay, this is near as a bias. Fame will be a, probably in yours, Sandy. Mm -hmm. for, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, I have raised you up for the very purpose of showing my power in you. You see, he's doing this to reveal two things, both his purpose and his Power. At least that's the new revised standard in the new international version. Now in the Greek, along with the complete Jewish Bible, the word for purpose here is demonstrate. He will demonstrate. Do you have that word in your Sandy? Demonstrate? Or anybody? Now, right off the bat, we can understand all the stuff about God revealing his power. He's been doing that since the beginning of time. Since he said, let there be light. God's been revealing his power. So we're going to have to look at that. But what does Paul tell us is the meaning, though, behind the words purpose or demonstrate? He reveals to us in verse 17 what is the purpose of God within who he picks and chooses. That, What's, his, na huh? that his name will be proclaimed. All right, very good. So that my name may be proclaimed in all Anybody got anything majorly different there? Declared. The, huh? Declared. Declared, okay. That's where fame came in for me. I was okay. at the end of the... All right, the word fame then. Now, the, uh, what's in the complete Jewish Bible, it says, so that my name might be known throughout the world, okay? Now, why is God, why is having God's name proclaimed, known, so important? Why is it so important that God's name be proclaimed or his fame or that his name be known? What would be the overall worldly reason why God is the one that needs to be known throughout the world? He, he made it. Or he made it. But who's the one that's always messing stuff up? And I'm not talking about the devil. We are. So that what no human person can then do what? What's one of the things we love to do as human beings? We want to take what? Proclaim. Create, well, huh? Proclaim. Well, no, not proclaim. But we human beings like to take what for something? Credit. 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 Well, we want to take our control. I'll give you the word control. But we also want to take credit for all the things that who has done? God. 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 Too many times people, we people, we like to take credit for the things that God has done. Now, does this mean that God has feelings of being conceited or feelings of jealousy toward us humans? No, it does not. But then why is it then important? Why is it important that we recognize God as the one who has done all this? Well, it's simple because our human works and actions can only do what for us? Overall, with our lives, our human actions can only do what for us? Nothing. Nothing, really. Can bring, can, they cannot bring true forgiveness. 
Our human actions cannot bring everlasting life into our lives or into this world. See, it's only by believing in God and recognizing Him and His works of mercy in our lives and in this world can we come to a true and complete what with God then? Relationship. Very good, very good. A true and complete relationship with Him. That is His purpose. You know, to have a relationship with us. But to us understanding, we've done nothing to give ourselves or to earn that relationship. It all comes because of the mercy of God. But overall, the point is this, okay? That God is free to pick and choose whom he pleases for his mercy, for his blessings, and also for his use. Even when those reasons for who he picks and chooses are not clear to us human beings, okay? Even if, but that's still not the greatest thing. The greatest the thing that it still means is this. It means that we do not, we cannot what with God. And Mr. Mr. Harold, you said the word. You said it earlier. Uh, not, it's, it's, not take credit, but what? Control. Control. See, the bottom line is this. We do not, more importantly, we cannot control God. Okay? And no matter how you feel about the Hebrew people, God still chooses them and still continues to love them and to be their God. We cannot tell him who he can pick, who he can choose. But here's the good news. Thankfully, the same thing can also be said for us. Because you see, through Christ, God has shown that he still chooses us and still continues to love us and to be our God. And he will always do this in spite of how there are other people in this world who want God to do what with us? Get rid of us. Get rid of us. <clears throat> Just as the Christians, early Christians, the early church, thought about, you know, said, are the Jews going to be punished? Are they going to get what they got coming? There are people in the world today who say the same thing about us Christians. Yes. You know? But the thing is, God picks and chooses who he gives his mercy Amen. to. Who he does not give his mercy to. He still chooses us. He still chooses the people of Israel. Okay? But now let's go back to verse 14. Because I want to bring it all together. We need to look at this verse. So there in verse 14, what then are we to say? The New Revival says, is there injustice on God's part? By no means. Now, the thing is this. Look at that statement. Look at that verse 14. Now, once again, they say that what Paul is doing here is that once again, he's imagining. That as he's bringing all this up, that there are going to be another question. There's going to be a question asked for him. Now, what do you think that question is? When he writes, what then are we to say? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. So what's the question? Well, Paul, is this fair? Or is it just for God to to do these. Is it fair that God chooses some while he does not choose others? Which can then lead us back into what belief? What's the, you know, God chooses some and not chooses others? That's the belief of what? Starts with the P. Predestination. predestination. But we're not going there. We talked about predestination today. You see, as far as Paul is concerned, his answer to all this, you know, we want, we want to go, well, is it fair for him to pick and choose? We've done nothing wrong. They killed his son. How is that fair? Then well, how is this just? But as far as Paul is concerned, he does have an answer. And his answer to all this is 
one. That God can do whatever he wants. wants. Whatever he chooses to do. God can do what he wants to do. Okay? You see, too often we expect the choices in our life to be fair, clear cut, everything according to the rules. And of course, the rules we want God and everybody else to follow, those rules are made up by who? Us. Us. <laughs> They're made up by the way we think that things should be done. Or worse, we want the rules to be made according to the way we what? Want them. Not that we think they should be done. This is what we want them to be done. And right off, immediately when God, you know, God does things that don't go according to what we think, they go according to our set of rules, we immediately begin to think what? We immediately begin to question God. Well, is, is this just? Is this fair, God? Because why? Because you didn't do it the way we think you ought to do it. <coughs> Or you think you should. But once again, for Paul, he wants us to remember this very important truth. We must remember, we did, we're we not the ones who wrote the rules for me. God. God did. God wrote the rules. And when this Paul is now then to simply defending the right of God to both not just make the rules, but he can also do what with the rules he created? Change. He can change them. He can follow them. He cannot follow them. God made the rules, and he can do with those rules what he wants to do, okay? Now, in talking about this, he makes reference to what, you know, in all of this, he makes a reference to Moses, okay? In the reference to Moses, Paul reminds us of what God said to Moses about how it is he who will decide to who he will give mercy to and to who he will not give mercy to. This is actually found in Exodus 33, 19. Exodus 33, 19 is where he does that. He continues on for he says to Moses in verse 15, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. This is where Moses, he's continuing to intercede for the Israelites following the building of what great big idol. You remember that they built out there in the wilderness. Moses has been gone for a long time, and so they're going to build the golden calf. The golden calf, okay? And I always laugh, because if you read the story, you know, Aaron built it. They gathered all the gold, and they melt it down, and Aaron builds the golden calf. Moses shows up, and the first thing he asks Aaron is, what happened? And Aaron goes, I don't know. We just threw the gold in the fire and I popped this golden calf. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? But the thing is this. In Exodus 33, 13, Moses reminds God that the people are still his what? The people. His people, his chosen people, okay? But for the Jewish Christians, once again, that this could also have been a reminder of something else. Now, this is something I learned. This is good. I hope I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. You see, with this, concerning, think about the overall story, though, of Moses. Remember when God calls Moses to go and set his people free there at the burning bush? Moses asked God a question. You know what I remember that question was? What is your name? name? Or who do I tell the people that sent me, okay? What is his name so he can tell his wife who it is that sent him? And as we know, God replies to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. He says, tell them that what? Do you remember? I am. I am, I am who I am has sent you. Remember, it's part of the great I am statements that Jesus also makes. The biggest one of all in John chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, ego in me. Ego in me is Greek for I am. The exact wording that God used 
as recorded in an ancient Greek text known as the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Okay? So it go in me. That's the way they record it. God says that's what Jesus says. It's part of the great I am that we've always associated with the name of God. Tell them that I am has sent you. I am who I am has sent you. Okay? But did you know that there is another way to translate what God says to Moses in that verse? There's actually a better translation. A better translation of it is this. Tell them that I will be what I will be. Has sent you. Not I am who I am has sent you. I will be what I will be. Has sent you. Now this translation tells us then what about God? That God is always going to be what? In control. Well, control. But more importantly, God's going to be God no matter what. God's going to be God no matter what. I will be what I will be. I never thought about this. But I double-checked it in the complete Jewish Bible. And it's actually got both of them side by side with it all. But more importantly, you see, we must never forget that it is not our job to control God. What we're called to do is simply then have faith and trust in God because we know what? That God always knows what? What's going to happen. What's going to happen, or more importantly, he knows what he is going to do. Is going to do. <laughs> he knows what he's going to do, and that the same thing can never said about who? Us. We don't always know what's going to happen. We don't always know what's going, what we're going to do. God always knows. But to bring it all together, I want to share with you, again, something else, Dr. Clarence Bentz. Remember, he's my my number one book commentator, the Wesley commentator, he writes this. He said, God's highest virtue is not to be fair in every situation. I had to double read this. I'll be honest with you. God's highest virtue, according to Dr. Bench, is not to be fair in every situation. Instead, it is to demonstrate compassion and mercy even when such an attitude is unwarranted on the part of the recipient. It's not God's God to be fair. His job is to demonstrate compassion and mercy, even when we have an attitude that means we don't deserve it. But in doing so, God is still just. God's still going to be God. So the thing is, how does it make you feel to know you cannot control God? Awesome. Awesome? That you feel awesome? What, what else? I don't want to control God. <laughs> Why does it make you feel to know you cannot control God? Yeah, it should make us feel awesome. It should make us feel great. Why? Life is unfair. Life is unfair. Yeah, life is, you know, we're never promised that yellow bird road, are we? Hmm. Life's not always fair. What you see is, the thing is, we should be excited. Feeling also we can't control, control God. You see, God is free to pick who he will and who he won't show mercy to. But see, what makes us actually make us feel great is what? That God has already revealed to us that he's already done what? God's already revealed that he's chosen who? The uh, Jewish people. The Jewish people and who else? Us. us. That he's already made the choice to always choose us no matter what. That he's already made the choice to not break his promise given to us, not just through Abraham and Sarah, but also through the gift and the sacrifice of his son. And that God has already made the choice to always love us no matter what we do in our lives. Same thing with the people of Israel. So let's, we can't hate them. We're supposed to be supporting them because they're still God's people. Just like we're still God's people, okay? Now, as I pointed out last week, Paul, most of the time with his writings, okay, as we go look at the whole picture now, he's using it directly to the point in what he's trying to say. But there are those times when he likes to give us a hidden meaning so that we'll dig a little bit more to what he's trying to teach us. 
And mm -hmm. remember last week I included to tell you that for me I have discovered two hidden meanings, okay, in what he's been trying to teach us. So as we look now at verses 1 through 18, let's look at the first of these two hidden meanings. First off, overall Paul wants us to discover, though, the biggest reason of all as why the Israelites are still God's chosen people. And the reason behind this is because if they are no longer God's chosen people, that means that in reality, God has gone and done what? Now, I'm not talking about that. That means he's broken his promises. He stopped loving them or no longer chooses them. Think about it overall. If God stops <coughs> choosing them, it's still no longer his people. See, the most important thing I believe that Paul wants us to understand is this, that if God, that there's lots of no longer God's chosen people, then that means that God overall has done what? Messed up? Not, well, I wouldn't say messed up, <clears throat> but that means God has overall done what? That God has changed. That God changed his mind, or worse, God himself has been changed, Okay. But the message that Paul wants us to understand is what? That our God never what? Never changes. Our God never changes. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't change himself. Now, we should talk about this because Paul points out to us about the, the making five references <laughs> to what? You see, Paul <laughs> makes five specific <coughs> references to the writings of the Old Testament. Remember? He talks to us about who are the sons of Abraham. Throughout this verse, these 1 through 18, he tells you, he first off talks to us about Ishmael and Isaac. He talks about the words of the prophet Malachi as he points to the twin sons who are they? Remember? Jacob's sons, Esau and Jacob. Yeah. And then he takes us on a journey through the book of Exodus, okay? So see, at least five that we know of specific references, he goes back to the writings of the Old Testament. The thing is, with all this, Paul then takes us from there. He takes us now to where he and all the other Christians are by pointing out this great truth then, that just as God did these things in the Old Testament, he still continues to what? Do them today because our God never changes. Just as he was in the Old Testament, he is still the same loving, caring God today. The thing is, in Malachi, if we were to go back to Malachi, and that say it is Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, the prophet on behalf of God himself tells us, this is God speaking, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, have not they haven't perished because God hasn't changed. And of course, there's always my favorite verse there in Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. That's the Greek translation. So the first thing overall, the hidden message through it all is simply this, that our God does not change. So tell me, how does it make you feel to know that our God never changes? Feels it should. We should feel good about it. What else makes us? How does it make you feel to know that God never changes? Well, you can count on it. You can count on it. Makes us feel good. For me, overall, it gives me a sense of security. There's security in knowing that we have a God who never changes. So what we're going to do is stop here because it's already after six thirty, and I've got a lot to go for the second hidden message. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of things in the second hidden message, okay? But the thing is this, we're not going to be meeting next week. I will be at, in Tupelo at our Mississippi United Methodist Annual Conference. So you're, you get a week break next week, okay? So the last week of June, we will not meet. But if y'all are in town, we'll meet, what, July, uh, July the 5th. Will y'all be here July the 5th? Will y'all be in town July the 5th? Because I think the 4th is on Tuesday. Yeah. All right. So we'll pick up July 15th. Back with all this, looking at that second hidden message.
Because the truth is, I still got two full pages to go on that, <laughs> on the second one. So, join your break. Please don't forget us. Come back and join us in two weeks as we continue to look at nine, chapter 9, verses 1 through 18. We will finish it up with that second hidden message, I promise. And then we're going to take, start off in chapter 11. So until we're together again, take care and God bless and goodbye.